of the things I wrote up here uh, is, in other words, everybody has a story. And so uh, we told you last night we're going to start you to working on interviewing and on profiles of each other uh, as a party, as a way of getting to know each other, but also as a first writing effort. And when I work with journalism students, I, I often use this, um, this as a technique for just getting them to, to practice sort of on each other. And, and then you learn about each other, and, and at the same time, you really get to sort of uh, work on your skill as an interviewer. So, so I really do believe that everybody has a story. Then in, in America, there's a television show or there's a news, a news program where they, they have a segment occasionally that's based on this idea that everybody has a story. This guy sort of throws a dart. I don't know if you know what a dart is, but in America, a lot of people, people play darts. Um, it has a sharp tip and, and, and you have a board where you just throw and you try to get closer to the bullseye, to the center of it. And, and so, so he takes the dart and he throws it at a map. And, and wherever it lands on the map, he goes to that town and he finds someone to interview with this idea that everybody has a story. Now, I believe that everyone has a story too. And the, the, our role as a storyteller is to bring those stories out of people and understand them when we actually see them, understand what the story is. One of the things about uh, the kind of work that we all do is that we, we go to places sometimes with very well formed ideas about what the story is, particularly when we're, when we're interviewing people. And this is one of the things we do a lot in feature writing, you know, they're, 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 they're people focused. So we arrive with this idea of what our story is going to be about. But if you allow yourself to believe that, this, that, that the story that you have in mind is maybe a valid story, but that your reporting, as I've talked about, may lead you someplace else, and that you may find out something else about that person or about that place, or about that space, or about that community that, that you find far more interesting and, and far more intriguing than you might otherwise would have, than you, than, than you did when you went there. So you, when you do that sometimes, it doesn't mean that you put your original story aside. Sometimes it means that you do more than one story. But it really sort of uh, um, goes with my idea, and I think the idea that a lot of journalists have, is that everybody has a story. And it, it, it's a test of your skill sometimes to see whether you can get that story out of them, um, which really is, is based on your, your, uh, your um, uh, ability as an interviewer. And, and, and one of the things you always want to do as an interviewer is to get people to tell you their stories, to get people to trust you with their stories. Because if people don't trust you with their stories, they won't tell you their stories and allow you to share their stories. So um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So I know that it seemed, based on our conversation yesterday, that kind of like two thirds or three quarters of you had already participated in a conversation with Stephen um, about interviewing people. So I don't want to um, rehash that too much, but I do want to talk about some basic ideas around interviewing. Um, um, because lots of times inter and you get one shot at the interview and if you blow the interview your ability to complete the piece um, you may not be able to complete your piece so um, so first thing I want to talk about is preparation because preparation is key to interviews so whenever I do an interview um, I try to over prepare for the interview so I will um, Google the person who I'm interviewing I'll learn what their area of expertise is or what their training or kind of like maybe their formal bio can I, can yes. I ask you, do you know what over prepare means oh thank you <laughs> ah thank you okay you always want to prepare yourself for your interview right but the interview could go all sorts of different ways that you don't expect so learn more in preparation for your interview than you think you're gonna need in your interview. So that's what I mean by over-prepare. So if the interview goes off in some other direction or if the interviewer starts telling you things that you hadn't expected, would um, the person would have gone into in the interview, you're able to continue to participate in the interview because you have done preparation beyond what you thought you would need. Does that make sense? Okay, so you want to over-prepare for your interview. 
And um, also, so in terms of your equipment, right, all of you have, so, have cell phones, right? And on your cell phone, you have various different recording apps. Um, I need to do some research on this, actually. Um, but we're going to talk about this next week. So I like a recording app. So I just up, upgraded my software, and I don't know what's what because I haven't used it with this software. But I like a recording app where I can email the file to myself um, or email the file someplace else so it exists not only on my phone or my device, but it also, I email it so it's in the cloud, so it's someplace else. So if I lose my device or something happens with the recording, um, that I've just made, it's backed up somewhere. Because once you lose, if you lose your recording, it's like, ah, oh, you may lose your ability to do the story. So when I interview somebody, I use a piece of equipment that I am very sure is gonna work. I make sure I check my battery level before the interview. I make sure that I have extra batteries with me when I do the interview. And for some interviews, I'll have two recorders running. So I may have my phone running, um, but I also, I actually prefer to use a digital recorder um, for interviews, and I'm somebody who records almost all of her interviews. Um, I do that, quite honestly, out of respect for the people who I'm interviewing to make sure that, um, you know, we have a great deal of responsibility for um, conveying what people say to us accurately. And so I will use a, um, a digital recorder. I like to use one that I can also connect to my computer so I can take the file off of here and drag it onto my computer. So that's another backup. Also, um, especially as you become more accomplished, you might not want to be, depending upon the project, like you may have to type your transcript really, really quickly or listen to it again and type the parts that you need or, or maybe you've taken some hand notes and go in and make sure that you have them accurate. Um, but sometimes there are projects that take longer to do and I'm a big proponent of having other people do um, some of the work that is not the main gift that you bring to the party. So there are pros and cons to this. Sometimes I like to type my own transcripts. To me, the benefit of typing my own transcript is I get to hear it again and I hear it more deeply, right? But sometimes you don't have time, you have to move quickly, so you just wanna go in and make sure that you heard that what you wrote is, is accurate. Um, but there are other times when I may not need the entire transcript and it may take too long for me to type the transcript. And so I have actually a very good friend who I pay to type my transcripts for me. And so she loves the work of doing the transcribing. And of course, I would not do this for a confidential interview, right? But she loves the work of doing the transcribing and that frees me to do the things that I'm best at. Um, so I really believe if you are a photographer, spend as much of your time and energy doing the photographing, and if there are other things that are non-essential things, whether you're a filmmaker, photographer, writer, the non-essential things, put together a team around you, if you can, to help you with those non-essential things, but people who love those other things. So I'm a big person who sends out transcripts. My friend April is typing transcripts for me right now. Um, so I'll... Sometimes I'll have two recorders running in case a battery dies, in case something happens for a really important interview. So that, to me, is part of my preparation. Also part of my preparation is I will write a long list of questions, everything that I can think of that I'll want to ask, that I could possibly want to ask this person. Um, and then I'll prioritize those questions so that the ones that I absolutely have to have the answers to before we get off the phone, and my interviews are phone interviews, so actually, I'll be interested in what you have to say because you do a lot of interviewing in person, and that's an entirely different dynamic. Um, when I do interviews in person, usually, maybe I'll be with the person for days on end because we're working on a book. Robert's doing interviews in person, and he might have to turn a story around within a couple of hours, so it's a very different thing. Um, so I'll make a long list of questions, and then I'll prioritize the questions so I know that if we have to get off the phone quickly, these are the five questions that I need to get answered. Um, so I'll make my long list of questions, I'll um, prioritize them. I'll also make sure that um, I write them in a way that sounds natural, like you would say them in a conversation. So sometimes at a, as a writer, kind of I get in my writer's head and I might write something in a way that sounds like an official way you would write something, but it's not the same as the way that I would speak it. 
And so I go through them again and make sure that I've written them conversationally because I want the person who I'm interviewing to feel comfortable, right? And by being conversational with them is one way that I do that. Depending upon, um, so ready, I mean, um, Stephen talked about the importance of making the person comfortable. And um, so maybe engaging in just some, some light, some preliminary conversation, um, whether it be about the weather or something happening in the world or um, challenges that you may have faced, if, you know, whatever, with traffic, getting there, just to, to show your humanity. Um, also, I always let people know when I'm going to turn my recorder on. There are laws in some states around turning your recorder on. But whether there's a law or not, where I am, I always give people the opportunity to know that the tape recorder is running now. But because when you tell people that a tape recorder is running, sometimes they get nervous and kind of stiff. I'll talk to them for a while after the tape recorder is running. Um, and my hope is that they forget that the tape recorder is running and um, relax into who they really are. Um, it's also important, and this is also why your preparation is really important, to be present. And one of the really beautiful things that I um, am picking up off of all of you is that you are so present in the moment. And sometimes when we do a lot of preparation, we can be in our head trying to remember all our questions and trying to, you know, um, it's important to be present because even though you did all this preparation, the structure and the preparation actually frees you to be in the moment and to go with the flow of the conversation. Because the questions, um, the person is going to go off in directions that you may not expect. They're going to tell you information that um, you're going to want to deviate from your list of questions and follow, um, follow where they're taking you. And so you want to be prepared enough so that you can go with the flow where the conversation goes. And also to listen between the lines of what they're saying. So sometimes people will say, um, say one thing, but maybe not say things. So you want to listen for what they're saying, as well as listening for what they're not saying. Or we call that kind of listening between the lines. Like, um, like if you think about a piece of paper, you have one, line, one sentence and the next line, the next line, the next line. But sometimes there are things that are going on that are not on the page. And you want to be able to be present for that and use your intuition. Um, to pick that kind of stuff up. Um, so I would conduct my interview mostly in kind of a logical order, making sure that I ask my most important questions first. And then, um, oh, always, always, I forgot this. Uh, make sure that you get the person's, the spelling of the person's name. Um, so if their name is Stephen, for instance, you can spell it two different ways. So make sure you ask them whether, you've, um, whether you're spelling their name correctly or ask them to spell their name. Same thing with their title. Um, make sure you get their title correct. And um, when I'm at the end of an interview, I may have asked all the questions that I've prepared to ask or that logically have come up in the interview. But I also always ask people toward the end, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you think um, that, that you would like me to know or that you think might be interesting or that you think might be relevant to this story. And it's amazing, sometimes the interview really begins at the end of the interview. Like when you give them space to tell them something that you might not have thought of or um, at that point in time maybe they're feeling more comfortable. And sometimes at the very end, the, ver the most interesting stuff um, comes out in the interview. So those are some of my thoughts around interviewing. I'd be really interested in hearing how that relates to your experience. And also feel free if you think I've left some things out. It, 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 it's, it's similar to me in a lot of ways. Uh, one, of the, one of the differences for me is that, that because I worked in, in hard news and not just feature news, when I, when I wrote features, it tended to be um, about subjects that began as sort of hard news subjects. So if, if, if I've covered uh, something about um, uh, some act of Congress, you know, I start off by, by covering that, and then, then I start talking about the practical effects of it, how it affects people's lives and things like that. So the, there is a difference, a little bit of a difference for me in that uh, I, I tended to interview, over the course of my career, I interviewed a lot of politicians. And, and so, so the preparation for me is the same, 
in that you, I always walked in to any interview I go into, if I go to a news conference, any place that I go to ask questions, I write down my questions first. And, and I try to write them down um, in a way that I can easily refer back to them um, for the simple reason that, that if I don't do that, I will forget to ask something that was important to me. And because interviews have a way of taking on their own life, us going, going in a, the direction that they do. And the interviewer sometimes can get caught up in telling you a story and you get caught up in listening to that story. And, and, uh, and, and then you realize I haven't asked questions that I really wanted to and really needed to ask. So, so it's, it's important to me to write them down. Uh, I, I don't necessarily try, and, and I, I think this, this all differs depending on the person. I don't necessarily try to structure them in a way that I would actually ask them because what I need in my mind is simply to refresh my mind about what I'm going to ask. And, and, and I, so I don't necessarily need to see it on paper the way I'm going to ask it. I just need to see that it's there. Now, what, and one thing Hillary, Hillary said that I, I think it's always in, in, important to develop some type of, of relationship with the person that you're interviewing, even if you only have a few minutes to do it. Because the one thing that I find that if even, even when you deal, you know, I dealt with politicians a lot and, and I've interviewed everybody from, from people who work for city governments to mayors, to governors, to, to, the, to, to presidents. So if you, if you, anytime you show up to interview somebody like that, they're prepared for what, what, what are the difficult questions. But the way to get people, I find, the, way, the best way to get people to answer difficult questions is to, to relax, get them to relax first, to trust you and to trust you to tell their stories. So um, I, I, never, I never start right into an interview by asking the most difficult questions. I, I want to start, and the other thing is, I want to develop a relationship with that person. So, and, and it's something that works for me personally, and I think to some degree we all have to figure out what works for us. But what works for me personally is to, to literally have a conversation with that person about how are you feeling, you know, if I know things about their personal lives and their families or their children or some adversity they've had or some success they've had, I ask about those things mm -hmm. because, because it's a good way of getting people to talk about themselves. Um, and, and if you're dealing with, with people where, even with people where the interviews might otherwise be, uh, come across as confrontational, I try to make sure that, that, they, that they know that I, I care about them as a person and not just, I'm not here to just write a story. So, um, so that's important to me. Now, one thing I will say, uh, it, depending, uh, depending on the person I'm interviewing, um, sometimes I like to exercise more control over the interview. Uh, that's particularly true with people who are politicians, people who work for, um, uh, in America we have these things called think tanks, they're policy groups, where they have a specific point of view that they want to get across. And, and they will come into an interview with what they call talking points. Okay, so, so just as I come in with my questions, they come, with, come in with their talking points. And th that's what they want me to know. So I've had politicians, I've had people from universities, I've had people from policy institutes. It, it's almost, it almost doesn't matter the question you ask. They have prepared answers because they have an agenda as well as you, and they want to make sure that they get those Answer, those answers out there. So for me, in a, situa in a situation like that, I want to maintain control of the interview. So because, because as you said, I'm, I'm the storyteller and here's what I need to know for my audience. Now, in, a, in an interview where, um, and I've done a lot of these things um, that, are, that are, have nothing to do, that despite the fact that I was primarily a political reporter, every now and then I would go off and do something that had nothing to do with politics. Um, I, um, I had heard, a, um, I had heard a, a, a blues radio show once um, that was done by a university professor, and he called himself the blues doctor. So most people who were on his radio show didn't know he was a college professor. And most of the people who knew him as a college professor didn't know he was this, this blues disc jockey. And, and I just found the two really interesting sort of um, different aspects of his life. And, and I knew him from, 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 uh, 
from calling him up to, to ask about policy issues because he was, he was a political science professor. I covered politics. And so if I wrote a story about something that was going on with the legislature or a fight between the state senate and the governor, I would call him up for, for a, a sort of impartial perspective about that. And then I find out he's doing this radio show. So when, I, when I'm interviewing him about the radio show, I allow him a lot more leeway, a lot more freedom to tell his story as he would tell it. So, so a lot depends on, on, a, on, the, on, on the situation and the kind of interview you're doing. Uh, I also use tape recorders. Uh, what I would say, uh, what I, and, and I use them differently in different situations as well. If I'm doing an interview that, that I have to write the story fairly quickly, I try to rely less on the, t on the tape recording um, because I, I don't have time to transcribe them. But, so, so, but here's the thing, when you're doing an interview in a situation where there's sort of this, 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 um, this um, the, the interview is done in sort of a, at a quick pace, at a fast pace, then I, I tend to focus more on my notes. But every person has to learn to take notes in a way that you don't lose eye contact. With, with the person that you're talking to. Because I find if I lose eye contact, they, they, I lose them. And they think you're not paying attention to them. So I try to maintain eye contact with people. Now, now I will say to you, that's different in different cultures. So in some cultures, and I try to be sensitive to that, um, there are some places where Americans, Americans tend to be people who give firm handshakes. They, they look you straight in the eye when they talk to you. But there are certain cultures where neither of those things works. So Hillary's talking about uh, preparing for your interview ahead of time and being overprepared, knowing more about the subject than you need to know. That's one of the things I try to find out about. If, if, if it's someone who's visiting from a foreign country, I try, or, or from a different part, I try to figure out what's going to be the way to relate to that person better. You know, so, so if I'm interviewing an American politician, I can sit down in front of them and start asking, rapidly asking questions. But if I'm interviewing a, uh, if I'm interviewing a farmer in the Mississippi Delta, you know, which is the state again where I'm from, um, if I'm interviewing a farmer about the effects of farm legislation out of Washington on, on his ability to make a living, I have to talk to him differently. So he's... I, and I've done this sort of thing where while people are actually at work, they're doing their jobs and I'm talking to them. So sometimes you want to maintain eye contact. Sometimes you don't be culturally sensitive about that. And I think in, in whatever situation you go into as the interviewer, you are the outsider. Even if you invite them into your space, even if you're talking to them on the phone, you are the outsider. You're trying to get them to trust you with their story. You defer to their cultural norms. And, and make sure that you're very careful with those things. So, so those, those are some of the tips. That, oh, I, the other thing about interviewing is, is, is I, I do take notes, but I have a way of taking notes so that my notebook is like this. And when I look down at it, and, and this is the thing you have to learn to do. You have to learn to write very quickly in those kinds of interviews in a way that you can actually read it afterwards. <laughs> so, and so, I, so I could go interview the governor and, and I'd have a recorder here, but I want to rely primarily on my notes. If I do it in the first half hour after I walk out the door, I can read my notes. Yeah. The next day, I yeah. can't understand anything I've written down, you know, or, or much of it anyway. And so, so what I tend to do with those is rely on a combination of my notes and the tape recorder. So where I have written something, so, so let's say I, I've started writing something and then the governor or whoever it is, says something that I find really interesting, but I'm not able to really get the quote down the way that I want it, then I rely on the tape recorder. Now, if I'm out in the field with a farmer, or if I'm talking to this guy who does a blues show on the radio that the people in the other side of his life know nothing about, I rely primarily on my tape recorder. So I think it, it a lot depends on the situation you're in, because I don't believe there is any one size fits all in terms of either the situation or in terms of you as a, as, as a storyteller. So you have to figure out what works best for you, and some of that will come through trial and error. What best works best for the story you're trying to tell, and what best works best for the situation that you're in. And, and, and I will end with, with, with the fact that, that I really do believe, and, and 
And I think this is one of the problems in American journalism is that most the majority of reporters are white. They come from a specific kind of culture. And, and we always talk about in America, America being a multicultural nation. It is. You know, the, the, cult, the social norms are different in the South than they are in the Northeast. They're different in the Midwest than they are in the South. They're different in the Southwest than they are in the Midwest. They're different in the, in the Far West than the, you know. So as you go across the, uh, the America, they're very different. And when I go to any region of the country to interview somebody who's different, I want to know what, what that's like. Because if I go to the South and somebody says to me, can I offer you a glass of iced tea? I'm going to say yes, whether I want a glass of iced tea or not. Because if I say no, they will be offended by it. And my interview is over. You know? so, so while you're speaking about the South, we've had some questions about your accent. OK. Uh -huh. So we were wondering if you might share with us how you might speak when you're down south. Well, speaking so, with so, so I've, lived in very, I've, lived, I've lived in different parts of the country. And I sort of joke that I've picked up bits and pieces from, from wherever I've lived. And, and, uh, and, and it, it all is layered on top of the Southern accent. You, you, hear, this, you hear this long explanation, right? Because that's where Southern is talk. <laughs> we, we're never in a hurry to do much of anything. So, so, um, uh, so let's, let's say, I'm going to the store to buy a loaf of bread. OK, well, this is a southern that, that that was without an accent. That was an attempt to do it without an accent. Yeah. But if I'm in the, if I'm in the south, I'm going to say I'm going to the store to buy a loaf of bread. <laughs> in the south, bread has two syllables. And, and I'm, I'm from Mississippi. I'm, uh, Missis speaking in, in, in your southern accent. I'm from Mississippi. <laughs> See, in Mississippi, and I can always tell when people really are from Mississippi. You know, because when they start, when they start, you know, they'll say Mississippi if they're talking to other people. But when they start talking to each other, they say Mississippi. And, 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 and. Uh, Keep speaking in your Southern accent. We've been having an ongoing conversation about accents. It's, it's, I, I, have to, I have to force myself to do it uh -huh. sometimes. I have to force myself to talk in my Southern accent. Um, the Southern accent, in a lot of ways, has some influences from the British accent. Because the British people are the ones who settled in the deep south of the United States of America. That, that's, that's kind of the difference. But I will tell you, if I go to the deep south, where people are, are sometimes going to be leery of strangers, I am always going to lapse into my southern accent. Always. You know? Um, but it just so... Yeah, it just I, I want to fit in as much as I can. Yeah. So can I ask you a question? Because you sure. have this situation... I rarely do. When you're dealing with somebody who doesn't want to talk to you, how do you deal with it when somebody's kind of hostile to you or mistrustful of you or not particularly participating in the interview? I would imagine in your experience, you've had that. I've had that happen a lot, often, a lot right? of times. The, the, the only reason somebody, the only reason the, the, people will talk to you only for only if, either of two reasons, I find, because they feel like they have to talk to you. Or, or because they trust you to tell their stories, you know. So, so they're, my, first, my first inclination is to do anything I can to gain their trust. And I have seen some people tell some very sensitive stories because I've been able to gain their trust or other journalists have been able to gain their trust. If I'm in a situation where someone is hostile, I, I never return that hostility. Never. Um, I, um, I, I try to remain unaffected by it. I try to make sure that I, I, I ask questions that are never intended to, to make matters worse than they are to, to, and make them angry. Um, I try to be sort of focused and straightforward in the questioning. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time exchanging pleasantries mm -hmm. because they don't want to exchange pleasantries with me. I don't share a glass of iced, iced tea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, uh, I try to, in, in those instances, I try to make sure the interview is very straightforward, but it's also very on point, meaning that, that I know what I'm going to go in to talk about, and, and, I, and I, I try to stick to that. And, and uh, that's, that, that, that's more often than not worked for me. Mm -hmm. I've only been thrown out of a couple of interviews. <laughs> wow, I've, I've never been, had that experience. I've been asked to leave interviews. But, but those tend to be... Those tend to be from politicians, mm -hmm. um, because politicians are people who speak to you because they feel like they have to. Um, 
You know, they, they understand, um, they dis politicians in America intensely distrust the media, but they believe they need to talk to you because there's something that they need to get done and they need you to help get that story out. But, but when you go in and you start, if you've got a politician who, who wants to talk about uh, what they've done to, um, to improve farming, but you know, but you have found out that they are under investigation for accepting illegal campaign donations from farm lobbies, and you ask about that, they will get very upset about it. And I, I have on a, on, on a few, a couple of occasions, maybe more, had people in the interview and either walk out of the interview or, or say the interview is over. And, and in, in America, politicians always have a press, a press secretary, you know, and, and they'll get upset. They'll say the interview is over. Well, what, what I try to do, there, there are a lot of journalists who, who sort of pride themselves on having these confrontational styles, you know, and there's, there's some controversy about that in America now. So, so in America, and, and some, you know, there was, a, there was a debate among the Republican candidates for president. So there is a debate in America about where the journalists ask fair questions. And, and, and I believe very often journalists ask questions that are the, 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 ultimately the question is fair, but how they phrase it may not be fair. So, uh, and, and people call it gotcha questions. In America, they, that's what they call it because they're trying to, they're trying to catch you at something. So um, now I believe, I believe our role as a political journalist, I believe my role is to hold politicians accountable to their constituents, to the people they work for, for the people who elected them. So. So it is. So I do believe that if a politician said, you know, I will, I will uh, never uh, vote to to uh, cut farm subsidies, and they cut farm subsidies, I'm going to say, you said you would never vote to cut farm subsidies, and you voted to cut farm subsidies. What changed that made you that you made vote that made you vote differently than you, than you promised you would? Now that's how I would ask a question. Now. Sometimes I watch people ask questions. Um, so the Americans are the the, the 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 Obama administration reached an um, an agreement with with Iran to um, for inspections of nuclear facilities and some other things. So a lot it's it's very controversial in the United States, and and the opposing party is for the most part almost completely against it. And so a reporter asked him a question, and I'll, so I'll tell you what I mean by a question, but the question is fair, but the way it's asked is not. There's a question for, there's a reporter for one of the television networks who's, who's, who, who um, was asking because there, there, was, there were some people, there were uh, Americans being held there who were being released, or, but there are these four Americans who everybody, there's been a lot of attention on them, and people are saying, when are they going to be released? And so when this deal came out, there was no provision in the deal for the release of those four people. And so this reporter said, started his question by saying, you know, how can you celebrate this victory, ignoring the fact that there are four Americans being held by the Iranians and, 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 just, and leaving them there to languish? Well, the president, the truth of the matter is the president is not going to leave any Americans to languish. So, the, you know, the, the question of wh what, what are you doing about these four hostages is fine, or these, these four detainees is fine, but that phrasing is not. So, so what I always try to do is ask questions in a straightforward way. Now, one thing that that's and, and can I ask what sure. you mean by straightforward? Like, what's well, the difference between the way that question was phrased and what you call a straightforward? I would have asked about the same thing. I, I, what, but what I would have said, you are celebrating this the, the the signing of this agreement today, but four Americans have been in, been detained by the Iranians for four years, and there is no provision in this agreement for their release. What are you doing to secure their release? That's what I would have asked. So when I hear that, I think what I'm hearing is a um, question that's objective, that mm -hmm. is based in the facts, as opposed to bringing your opinion or bringing a your opinion into it. Yes, a judgment to it. Okay. Yes. So I just wanted to make sure. You were and right. now, now here's one thing that reporters, and I'll and I'll finish with this. One thing that reporter said 
is that, that can, I, can I just yeah, go please. back a little? Okay. And so the reason that you would want to phrase the question in a more objective way that doesn't bring your opinion into it or perhaps um, make the person feel judged would be what? Would be what are you what do you what can you accomplish that way that doesn't be, because be, because both particularly in terms of politicians, but but the people we interview every day in a lot of roles, whether they're politicians or whether they're business, I'm sorry, whether they're business people or whether they're farmers, d believe we we that believe that we have this inherent this built-in bias. They believe we naturally bias, and they believe we have these opinions. The audiences that we report to believe we have these biases, and so I want to ask a question in a way that says to this politician and to this audience that I don't have a whatever my point of view here is, I'm not, I'm not going to express it. So I, my point of view doesn't matter here. The, you know, what, what I'm trying to do is convey information from this person to this audience. And my point of view has nothing to do with that. So that, that, that's why I try to ask questions in that way. And then also, um, another reason that comes to my mind is you're trying to build a long-term relationship with exactly. somebody who you're going to go back to again and again and again. And um, you want them to cooperate in an interview. And so if they think that you are unfair to them or they think you're trying to catch them with something or try to make them make a mistake, they might not be willing to have that relationship with you that will help you be the journalist right. that you're capable That's of being. That's true. The, the other side of that, though, is that, that sometimes when you report what, is, what are facts, some politicians will get upset with you about that. Mm -hmm. and, they'll, they'll, and they'll say, I'm never interviewing with you again. And my attitude about that is I'm only reporting facts and, and you have to make your choices about whether you, whether you talk to me or not. So, so I, what I wanted to say real quickly though is that that same reporter, uh, someone asked him why he phrased his question that way and one of the things he said was that, that he has been, he, you know, he's covered Obama for a long time and he has been wondering for himself whether he's asking difficult enough questions. Okay, so I will tell you when you cover a politician in, a, in, in, a, in America, and I think it's probably true in most countries, and you spend a lot of time with them, you get to know them, you know. So, so when I was in Washington, um, you know, I, I, by, the time, by the time Bill Clinton got to be elected president, I knew Bill Clinton fairly well. I knew Hillary Clinton fairly well. I, you know, Chelsea Clinton, their daughter was a little girl, but I'd gotten to see her around and see her play. So you you see the fan, you see them as, as as people, not as politicians, and you're very disarmed by that. You 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 reach the point where you know they're nice people, you know, and 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 you and you like them. So and they can be very charming, and 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 uh, and so you really do have to ask yourself. Am I asking the right question? So that's a legitimate thing to do. And I think it's something for you to remember. Whatever, whatever kinds of people you're interviewing, uh, you, you know, it's fine to like people, but ask yourself, am I asking the right questions? And that's often true with people who are politicians or, or who are involved in some controversy, and you like them, but your role is as a storyteller and to extract from them as much information that's relevant to your audience as you possibly can. So, so he, so he, it's fair for him to say, I had to ask myself, am I asking difficult enough questions? But, but you know, you don't start a question by making an erroneous assumption and then insulting the person that you're talking to. Okay, so um, I am, I rarely am working with somebody who, interviewing somebody who I have a hostile relationship with. So I might be interviewing a doctor or a psychologist or a medical expert or an academic expert or somebody like that. And um, so when I interview them, lots of times to the point that you were making about people talking to you in talking points, sometimes these people speak to you in big words that nobody ever uses or understands. And when you write it on the paper, it just will be like Bleh, in the middle of your paper, right? Um, or in the middle of your story. And so lots of times with those kinds of people, I ask them to tell me things the way they would tell their mother. You know, so that I get a conversational response rather than a response that I can't use and then I have to paraphrase. So I'll ask them to say it to me in plain English. Um, and sometimes they forget and they go back into their, we call it wonky, like their wonky voice. Um, and I'll ask them, you know, okay, I get it. Now will you say, restate that for me in plain English? And they're like, oh, sorry. And then they'll say that. Um, with people like that, um, so 
also sometimes I'll interview people. So for instance, I interview um, people sometimes who have a health problem or we've been having this conversation about doing stories um, about people or families where maybe there's a mental health problem or maybe there's abuse within the family. Um, one thing that I tell people in those kinds of situations because they're doing a favor by allowing me to interview them and by sharing personal things about them, I always tell them I won't hurt you. I'm not here to embarrass you or um, you know, kind of tell all your business in a way that it will make you difficult to, for you to continue to live your life in the community. Or if I'm working on a book project with somebody, I'll tell them, you can tell me everything, right? But then we'll engage in some negotiations around what I actually publish. And so sometimes there are things that are very personal that I think need to be published and they'll tell me, but then when I write it and I include it, they'll tell me I don't want that in there, right? And then I'll have to be able to explain to them why I think that that should be in there. And so there's, um, and, and usually I'm successful, but I have to be clear when I write why I think that, like, um, so we call it salacious. There's a word salacious detail. So it might be a really personal detail or like juicy or gossipy kind of detail. Um, I have to be clear why I'm including that in the story. And if I'm clear, usually I can convince them that it's important. Or I'll tell them that we can talk about this really difficult subject a number of different ways. One is we can talk about it like, kind of like we're, we're on the ground and, and I'm getting every detail of it and we expand that part of the story so that it's long and we get all these details, right? Or I can pretend like I'm in an airplane and fly at like 10,000 feet, which is low for an airplane to fly, right? And so I will still tell the story, but maybe the story, that part of the story won't be a whole page long. There will be fewer details. Maybe it'll be a paragraph long, right? Or sometimes there's certain things that are very painful to people or it would harm other people. And so maybe we'll just talk about it in a sentence or two, or maybe one sentence, or maybe even a phrase. Um, so that's a, a thing that I'm always aware of with the people who I'm working with because there's rarely, like I don't want to hurt the people who I'm working with. I don't want them, I don't want the world that they have to live in after I leave to be a place that's uncomfortable for them yeah. because they were generous enough to me and kind enough to me to share. That's very important to me. So I'm very open in telling people that. Also to get them to share, lots of times I'll share. So Robert was talking about having a conversation with people. Um, I'm, as you probably can see about me, I can be very transparent about things about me. And I'm often looking for the commonality between me and another person. And so sometimes a way that I open them up and make them comfortable sharing with me is I will share something similar about myself first. Um, so I wanted to say that. Um, also, with experts, sometimes once they get comfortable with you, you're interviewing them and they're a professional, so they're a doctor or they're a psychologist or they're a professor, but they get comfortable with you and maybe they, they get a little too comfortable and a little too casual. I always tell them that I'll clean them up. So I'm not, like I've never written for the New York Times, so at, the, at um, some of the highest level news organizations, you might publish exactly what they say and you don't change it, right? But for a feature or for a magazine, lots of times, and you'll need to talk to your editor about this, there's a little wiggle room to fix things a little bit. And if, so, I can, yes. if I can pick, pick, say something about that. One thing, I'm, and I, 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 I advise reporters who work from, for, in, in hard news situations to be careful about how you quote people uh, because you don't want to embarrass people. And, uh, and, and, and if I may, um, the, the, I worked for the Associated Press, and you know the Associated Press covers lots of sports. So baseball in, in, in baseball in America, 40% of the players speak Spanish as a first language. Okay, 40% of them speak Spanish as a first language, and and at, this was a point where the Associated Press had only two reporters who spoke Spanish at all, which is which is a problem. So this is you know we talk about diversity. So. The, the reporters thought it was funny to quote the Spanish-speaking players in a way that made them sound really stupid. And, and I never thought it was funny. Baseball had been very, very good to me, you know. And that, that's kind of a famous quote in America. 
They, but it was, it was intended to make fun of the player. And so the players realized they're making fun of us. And so they called the sports editor of the Associated Press and the, 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 the head of the players union called the sports editor of the Associated Press and said, look, you know, can you ask your reporters not to do this? And my feeling is it's better to paraphrase. That's what I'm talking about. When you get a quote that's not very articulate, it's better to paraphrase. So the, the, the head of the players union called the sports editor of the Associated Press and said, you know, your reporters are making my guys look stupid. And they're not. They're struggling with the language. And so um, can you not do that? Can you ask it? And she said a profanity to him and told him, no, you know, that's your problem. So th he said, OK. And he got off the phone. And, but what they said to the players were, speak to the Associated Press only in Spanish. <laughs> and it's up to them to get it translated. And then they call me in to, then they call me in to say, what do we do about it? Well, first of all, you shouldn't have insulted him. But that's, that, the problem I have with this is that if, 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 I come to, if I come to your country and learn your language, I would hope that you not make me look stupid by having difficulty with the language. You know, I, I, I used to speak a little bit of French. It's, I, I, almost none now. But I used to speak it well enough that if I went to Montreal or somewhere, I could get around. Um, I would hope that people wouldn't make fun of me because I don't speak the language well. The same is true for uneducated people. You know, they sometimes may be inarticulate, but, 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 but you know what their stories are. And that's what I mean by being careful with people's stories, because you can hurt people's feelings that way. And particularly when they're, you know, particularly when they're, they're people who have done you a service by, a lot, by, by giving you their time and their stories. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, that's a fantastic example. Um, and then I think the last thing that I wanted to share, particularly for those of you who are gonna do feature writing, details are really important, right? Because you wanna paint, you always wanna be painting with words and you want your reader to be able to hear it, smell it, um, taste it, whatever, you know, see it. Um, and so- Feel it. Feel it, yes. And so details, asking questions about details can become very important. You know, um, what color was it? How did it feel to you? What was the sensation? Um, how do you remember it? How did it smell? Um, so for those of you who are doing feature writing, remember the senses. Remember to ask questions about the senses so that can show up on the page. Also, if you're, if you're doing those kind of interviews in person, um, you can um, ask the person if it's okay if you take, a, take photographs so you get the setting, right? You might wanna take photographs kind of on your way there to get the outdoor setting or, or the indoor setting depending upon the environment. Um, sometimes people will allow you to take pictures of them. So I've, I'm working on a project with, um, some, uh, with a famous American football player. I have a book due in three months. And we're just getting started, and that's not a lot of time. And she came here anyway. And I came here anyhow, <laughs> which was, was quite stressful. But um, so part of how we're dealing with that is I, I went to his house in California, and I took a lot of pictures. And I'm asking him, send me pictures of things, because that will help me paint the picture on the page. And you can do the same thing. And some of you are videographers. You can do the same thing and have that show, have this, or, or audio. You can turn on your recorder and get the sounds, and then that can show up on the page. So, and I do want to say one other thing that that um, magnifies something else Hillary said, and and, and I, all of you know about that. After these two weeks, I tell a lot of stories, but but connect, connecting to people in some way, sharing your your story, you know, sometimes can help a lot. So, quick story: I had become the the bureau chief for the Associated Press in upstate New York, and uh, I had three reporters who were going to interview the governor. And there were all these questions at the time about whether he was going to run for president. And the man named George Pataki, he's running for president now, he's not going to win. Uh, <laughs> but there were, there were all these questions at that time about whether he was going to run for president. And my reporters had an interview with him, so, so I went along with him because I wanted to meet him. So I got to his office and he was very cordial, a very nice man. And it talked about liking, I really liked, liked him. And, and he had, gotten someone to dig into my background a little, you know, and he starts to say, you've done this and you've done this and you've done this. And he says, I'm very impressed by that. And I said, I'm just a hick who made good. And I, and I don't know if you know what the hick means, but, but in America, a hick is uh, 
sort of a person who's from a rural area and they're kind of uh, unsophisticated and ignorant, you know? So I said, I'm a hick who made good. And he said, I am too. And that connected with him. And he has liked me ever since, just for that one little statement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I worked for the Associated Press for a very long time. The Associated Press does not publish off the record information. So um, I will accept uh, someone telling me something off the record if it's to point me in the direction of, of finding out something that I might not otherwise find out. But I'm not going to publish that um, because I believe it's unfair. Sometimes people use off the record sometimes to hide behind things. Uh, sometimes they really, they, they, sometimes it, there's risk to them telling you that. And so, so I think, uh, so, so I respect that sometimes. I respect that there, that, that there are reasons that people might want to do it. So if they say this is off the record, uh, I will oftentimes agree to that, but explain to them that the only way I can publish it is that I'm able to verify it in, in other ways. Um, now, the, now, I have had people say to me something that they kind of regretted saying and then say, that was off the record. And no. Now, once it's out, once you've said it, it it's not off the record. It's on the record. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not the kind who really wants to embarrass people or get them into trouble. So somebody has told me something I know will make them lose their job or, or get them in a lot of trouble, then, then you know, it's, I, I, then the same rules sort of apply to me. But, um, but so that's kind of how I, I deal with off the record. As for seeing the draft um, and, and the kind of journalism that I've done, never. Um, you know, I, I, if, you, if, you, if you were concerned about something you said to me, I'm happy to read back to you quotes and things like that. But I would, but, uh, uh, and this is different in some, kind of, some kinds of journalism. But, in, but I would never let anybody see a draft of a story that I've written. And as to the place, I'm not that hung up on a place as long as I know it's safe. Um, you, know, some, you know, some people have preferences about those things. I rarely do. Um, I, I think, you know, is it safe? Is it comfortable? You, know, you, have, to, you have to be concerned about background noise if you're recording. Yeah, right? yeah. But, so um, distractions of various kinds. Um, again, if it's people who are telling you things that are sensitive and don't need to be seen talking to you in certain places, I've had that happen. Um, if it's people who uh, say, you know, um, and, I, and I talk about farmers because I'm, I, I, um, because I've, not so much because I've written a lot about farmers, but because I've written a lot about people who come from situations where they're uncomfortable in, in uh, big, you know, settings with large people and uh, I mean, large, large groups of people and certain types of people. So if they're uncomfortable coming in those settings, um, you know, I'll, I'll come to you, you know. Um, so, so I don't have, you know, that, that I don't have much of a problem with. Can, I want to add something because my work is a little bit different. So um, about the um, letting people see my draft. I never let people see my draft, but what I sometimes do is send them the quote that I want to use, and I may send them a paragraph before or a paragraph after, like if I'm doing a book. So the book that I wrote on black boys, right? I interviewed 50 people, right? And these are people who I have long-standing relationships with, but more, and I want to make sure that it's accurate and some of it was very technical. So, and, and some of these people talk to me for two hours and so I'm extracting things out and piecing them together and I want it to be right. So for those people, I would send them, I promised them that I would send them the quotes to check for accuracy. I, um, so I would send them the quotes. Sometimes there were, there were quotes that I had cleaned up a little bit. I would send them the quote. Sometimes I would send them the paragraph before or whatever explanation of their research that I did and to make sure that that was accurate. And that was part of how I fact checked my book to make sure that it was accurate. And most news organizations feel strongly about it and they should, is that if you get something wrong, you say, we got it wrong, and here's what the correct thing is. And you don't hesitate to do that. Um, everybody makes mistakes. You know, um, I, 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 I always try to be very careful. Um, in, in the Associated Press, I will say, if you, what, if you get what the AP calls a corrective, they put it in your personnel file. Um, I mean, that's how seriously they take it. 
And in all my years of reporting for the Associated Press, I only got one, and my source admitted giving me erroneous information um, because I, I, I like to check. But having said that, we're all humans. We make mistakes. But if my attitude is if you get it wrong, you admit that you got it wrong, and, and, you, um, and, and you, you say what is right. Now, in terms of how it appears, that's a different, that kind of a different story. Most news organizations don't like to repeat the error. They will say something to the effect, and the New York Times does this. So um, most newspapers will, or news organizations will say, on Thursday, we erroneously reported information about, and not necessarily repeat the error. The correct information is this. And, and then the third, um, every journalist has a weakness. You know, and um, there, every journalist has something that they feel uncomfortable covering, subjects they feel, you know, um, a couple of things that I, 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 as a journalist, refused to cover. One was an execution, uh, because I, I, I have a very deeply held personal belief against capital punishment, and, and I was assigned to cover a, 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 um, an execution, and I refused. Um, and in terms of weaknesses, as, as, you know, in terms of our abilities, we all have those too, and we have to understand where we have them, and, and, and we have to listen to people when they, they point them out to us, and, and, and seek out the, other, the advice of people that we know and that we trust if we know that we have those weaknesses.